At the southern tip of Pinellas County, there's a small green space called Bay Vista Park. It's one of about 36 pocket parks local artist Shondell Joyce visited with her students this season. This spot, mm -hmm. this is my first time here. First time in the park? Or yes. This? Okay. Um, most of the sites where we paint, we paint one time and then we move to the next one. So we tour lots of different spots in Pinellas and in the course of the season, there's about 36 classes or so. So you wind up seeing at least 36 new places that you've never been. It does. During the summer is when I do the scouting. <laughs> when it's the hottest part of the yes. year, really? <laughs> yes, because most people don't want to paint in the summer. It's a little too oh, hot. Okay, to so you have the time. Yeah, so that's my time to scout. And what I usually do is I take my bicycle on the Pinellas Rail Trail and go from spot to spot until I find something you know unique and worth visiting. What I look for in a scene is something to both show a be the beauty of the area we're in, but also the fragility. You know, this little pocket park, and this whole season we're visiting pocket parks, this little pocket park is the only bit of nature within about 20 um, blocks of the area. The next one would be Maximo, further down. And for wildlife, this is crucial for their survival. But humans too, like we don't realize how much we need nature and the peace and serenity you can find under the trees and in the shade and on the grass. You know, without it, the stress would kill us. So these little pocket parks are lifesavers, not only for the wildlife, but for us. So we try to show the beauty of them, why they're worth preserving. And, you know, there's always the opportunity to purchase land for the county and create new pocket parks. So when that happens, we're going to have a ready-made group of people with paintings ready to show the importance and beauty of these uh, parks to any um, civic organization or municipality that's interested. Yeah. So we'll be speaking on behalf of the parks to try to preserve them, try to nice. create more. Well, you know, what I like about it is the, the human structures here. Human structures are not a big heavy building of condos. You know, it doesn't have the same kind of footprint. Instead, this structure is integrated into the water. You have the water overlapping it. You have it overlapping the water. The skyway is off in the distance. I'm just about to put that in. And, you know, it's a massive structure. And when you're on it, it's like a, one of the seven wonders of the world if you're driving across it. But from here in the distance, this kind of makes it more human scale. You're seeing where it really fits in the landscape. So between the sky and the water is the skyway. And it's a bridge between the two, literally. And it's not all that from this distance. And what I love about this scene is you really have the illusion of perspective from an artist's vantage. We live in a bowl. And if you look directly overhead, the sky is darkest. At the horizon line, it's lightest because the horizon is further away than what's overhead. So I always start by painting the horizon as light. You see the clouds are closer packed closer together on the horizon. As you get to the middle ground, they start to spread apart a little, and then they become very fluffy and light directly overhead. So this is where I would always put the lightest light and the big shapes in those clouds. The same is true for the water, you know, close to the horizon. That that water, you don't see any differentiation of the waves out there on the horizon line. They're all packed tight together. 
as you move to the middle, you start to see thin lines that are spaced close together. And you start to see a little more individuation in the waves. As you come to shore, these waves start to be way farther apart and spaced further apart. You also start to see some height to them. Uh, we don't have much wind today, so there's not a whole lot of height. But that's why I space them a little further apart. And those three things will create the illusion of perspective in a painting. Well, a lot of the people who come here are fairly skilled, like they've been painting for a while. We do have some people who are absolute beginners, but this is out of the frying pan and into the fire for absolute beginners. Uh, it's challenging enough to try to capture a flat photo onto a two-dimensional surface, but when you're out here in the real world, you literally have to take a bite-sized piece of what you're looking at, decide what you're going to leave out, what you're going to paint in, and simplify it as much as possible. So the first month of our series, November, is on how to determine what you're going to paint, like what little bit of the landscape you're going to include. Are you going to put in the telephone poles in the cars, or are you going to leave them out? And, you know, each class I do a demonstration, which is simple, getting, it's geared towards any medium and towards beginners. So that way people, you know, at least know how to start and then they'll struggle through the rest of the painting. Next time they come, they'll learn how to get the cast shadows and all the values. Um, next time they come, they'll learn how to paint palm trees. Next time they come, they'll learn how to create the illusion of perspective. So, you know, each week is more of a bite-sized chunk of how to paint and what to paint so that you're not totally overwhelmed. <laughs> On top of that, you have changing light, insects, which you probably see me doing a little dance here, <laughs> um, and curious tourists. Because yeah. people, we're magnets. People love to come over and see what you're doing. Um, tell you about how their grandchild is an artist and you know often you may be the only person they talk to in the day Aww. so you know they really get excited about seeing artists at work oh that's a good question well I have been painting for a a pretty long time at this point. It's about 33 years for me. And I started off as a political painter. I did a lot of um, angry young woman paintings. I was in Soho in the East Village in New York for about 10 years making art that nobody wanted to buy and <laughs> definitely didn't want to hang up. And during that time, I was an artist apprentice. So I worked in the studios of other artists and was actually paid to do their paintings for them, even down to signing the signature in wow. some cases. Um, and that was wonderful. It was a good learning experience. I, I saw what the art world was like. And to me, you know, it was very material, very empty, very vacuous. It didn't have a lot of content. I also saw the great potential for art as a community building tool. And so I moved upstate where in New York, you know, it was mostly farms. And I learned about the Hudson River School and I was really deeply inspired by them. And, and transcendentalism, the concept of, you know, seeing nature as bigger than humanity and the spiritual quality of nature. And that pushed me into more of a, an eco-minded uh, outlook. At the same time, I started writing a nationally syndicated newspaper column called Sustainable Living. Hmm. And every week we talked about, you know, simple doable things that people could do to help curb climate change and help live greener and lightly on the earth. And so the, these things were always in my head while I'm painting. 
And I integrated the two into my approach to teaching and painting. And I started a school that still exists in New York that was based on that concept. And I'll be, you know, heading back up to teach a workshop this summer. But, you know, it, it went over well. And so other people took it up, took it as their own, and are, are doing well with it. So I came here because we, we face different challenges in different areas. Like we have place-based problems and solutions. And so here, you know, the challenges are more the eroding shoreline from sea level rise, the intensity of the storms and how they wash off the beaches. And, you know, the challenges to wildlife like the manatees and red tide. And so during each class, we, we talk about how we as people and residents and stakeholders can lessen our impact and raise consciousness at the same time as we learn about painting and capturing this particular moment in time at this particular place. So in a sense, we're chronicling this area and this time. You know, art is more than just the finished product. Art is also the process, and art can be a community building process when you work together and you create a sense of community. So that's my goal as an artist, is to bring other people out to these beautiful and fragile places, let them see it through artist's eyes. And, you know, even take it back home or post it on social media and talk about how crucial these places are you know, to us, to our economy, to nature.